All right. Here we are. I'm just going to pull up the syllabus to remind us where we're at. As I let more folks in. All right. We're here uh, this week. We're continuing on in chapter three on differentiation rules. And we have three sections this week. 3.4 is pretty long, so we'll probably spell this out with that. Now. Okay, okay. Letting lots of people in and muting them. Okay, so 3.3 is on derivatives of trig functions. And we're starting out with a couple of definitions. Um, and we're gonna be using these later on. The limit as theta goes to zero of sine theta over theta is one. And the limit as theta goes to zero of cos theta minus one over theta is zero. And so again, we're gonna see these being used in a bit. And some other definitions, the derivative of sine is cosine. Derivative of tan is secant squared. Derivative of secant is secant tan. And I encourage you to write these the same way that I am with the derivative of cosine over here. And it's the opposite of sine. And the derivative of cotan over here, and it's the opposite of cosecant squared. And the derivative of cosecant, it's negative cosecant cotan. And so we can kind of see this pattern where, you know, on the left, derivative of sine is cosine. But on the right, the derivative of cosine is the, notice the ones, all these on the right have negatives. So it's almost like the inverse, right? Derivative of tan is secant squared, but then the derivative of cotan, it's negative cosecant squared. And derivative of secant is secant tan. Derivative of cosecant is the opposite of cosecant. And so, these are, you know, the main six trig functions. And if I bring this cheat sheet over, I'm gonna put it. Yeah. Common derivatives. All right, so this is the third page. Notice, like, we've seen these derivative of a constant times a function. It's the constant times the derivative of the function. Derivative of the sum or difference is the sum or difference of the derivatives. Here's the product rule. When you take the derivative of the product, it's, well, okay, so they have it in, the, in a different order. But it's the first times derivative of the second 
plus uh, the second times derivative of the first. So they write it in a different order. Um, likewise, with the quotient rule, it's the bottom times derivative of the top minus the top times the derivative of the bottom all over the bottom squared. Derivative of a constant is zero. Here we have the power rule. So the derivative of a power function, you bring the power down in front and then subtract one from the old power. We're going to be looking at the chain rule. That's in 3.4. And then we have some common derivatives here. Derivative of x is 1. Um, the derivative of e to the x is e to the x. We saw that last time. And now we've got these six common trig functions. But they don't have them written in the nice pattern that I do. OK, and we're going to be looking at the derivative of the inverse trig functions you know, natural log and log functions. Okay, so let's do some problems. Differentiate this function. So the derivative, we can look at that as the product of two functions, where the first function is x squared and the second function is sine x. So it's the first times the derivative of the second plus the second. That's not the second. Sorry, I'm looking at something else. <laughs> plus the second times the derivative of the first. And, you know, we'd write the 2x in front. Okay. Find the derivative of secant 10. So y prime, it's the first times the derivative of the second. So look, the derivative of tangent is secant squared. plus the second times the derivative of the first and the derivative of secant is secant tan. Okay, so we can factor out a secant. And what's left is secant squared plus tan squared. Okay. Is that a secant squared or a cosecant squared? It's a secant. I, I, I realize it's a secant. I did my S different there, didn't I? Okay, thank you. Yeah. I know. I thought that as I was doing it. <laughs> and I really try to be consistent. So that's that that's you on your toes right there. Um, I'm letting people in everything else there. Okay. How about this one? Y equals A cos T plus T squared sine T. 
I know. You, you know, I usually talk about this at some point um, and maybe no time like the present, especially since you brought that up about the S. Literally, as I started going through taking math classes, all of my writing changed. And um, I totally encourage you. You know, I probably started out doing X's and Y's like that. But you know what happens after a while when you're writing really quickly? <laughs> you can't tell if it's an X or a Y, can you? In fact, anything that has, you know, like straight lines, I started making curvy. Z's I started crossing. Sevens I started crossing. Because all of these straight lines get really, really difficult to um, read. And then, you know, like lowercase and uppercase letters, I probably was never, you know, very careful about that before. In some classes, I even, you know, would do stuff like that because my capital C's had to be distinguished from my lowercase C's. So anytime you need, like, for sure, you know, a capital, you know, putting bars around it, uh, maybe the R is pretty obvious. That's all the set of real numbers. Um, I'm trying to think, you know, I know that that's like a Roman numeral, but um, sometimes you just really had to have to, you know, like make something really clear that it's a capital letter. You will see as you move along. Um, but yeah, so being careful about lower and uppercase letters. And how about T? So, you know, I hope that helped because as you go along, it's going to become more and more important. For sure, the X's and Y's. I mean, I started doing that, you know, these probably in algebra. So if you haven't started doing that yet, and in fact, like I think some people, they, they do their twos and it looks like a Z, you know, make your two, like things that you can make curly are easier to distinguish. Okay. If you can make something curly, make it curly. Professor? Yeah. In that last uh, problem, when you said to cancel out the secant, what other secant did you cancel the secant out with? Oh, I didn't cancel it. I factored it out. Oh, okay. Yeah. I factored out one. All right. Thanks. So yeah, if your fives, twos, and z's all look the same, you're going to be in trouble. And like, I'm amazed that you've gotten this far, if that's the case, you know, unless you're just really, really careful. Maybe that's my fault <laughs> as well, that I'm just a little bit more sloppy. But, you know, if you've ever seen like an architect, they all have similar writing. You look at pretty much any mathematician, they all have similar writing because it's like you you learn, you know, to adopt the convention. So, okay. The derivative, so A is a constant. And so you're just going to pull the constant out for the derivative. And then the derivative of cosine is the opposite of sine. And now you have two functions, right? So you, you need to be able to distinguish a constant times a function from two functions, right? This is one function, that's another function, a function of a variable, right? You could have a constant function, sure, but it's just a constant. So now you have the first times the derivative of the second plus the second times the derivative of the first. 
Okay, and again, we would just write uh, that 2t in the front. See how I even do my lowercase t's? I try to make them curly, so they don't look like that, you know, because before you know it, that starts looking like an x and everything else. So curly t. Right. Honestly, half this stuff I don't even think about anymore because I just do it naturally after years of doing it. But I'm trying to help you all out. <laughs> Things I wish people had told me before I like learned the hard way, right? By looking back at some homework problems or even a, an exam or I couldn't follow my own writing, you know, or maybe a teacher could Okay, and no section would be complete without find the equation of the tangent line. To this curve. At this point. Okay. So we want to get the derivative because the slope of the tangent line is the derivative at that point. So again, look at this as two functions. And you've got the first times the derivative of the second plus the second times the derivative of the first. Now I'm gonna factor out the two e to the x, and I'm gonna write the positive one first and see how that just looks nicer. Cos x minus sine x. Okay, so again, the slope it's the derivative at that point. So when x is uh, zero, <laughs> I had one job. When x is zero, so you put zero in for x. Okay, so that's... Um, two times one minus zero equals two. So that's the slope. Now you're gonna put that in the point slope form. So you got y minus two, it's that slope times x minus zero. And add two to both sides. Okay. All right, here's another one. And can you say the quotient rule? Right, that's a quotient. So the derivative using the quotient rule, it's the bottom times the derivative of the top. So the derivative of tan is secant squared. Derivative of the constant is zero. Minus the top times the derivative of the bottom. And the derivative of secant is secant tan. All over the bottom squared. So let's see, we've got secant cubed x minus, 
distributing, you know, on the right there, you've got secant times tan squared. And then um, I'll distribute the minus at the same time. And then you've got plus secant tan all over secant squared, right? So now on the top, I can factor out one secant and I'm left with secant squared minus tan squared, uh, yeah, tan squared plus tan all over secant squared. So now that secant cancels one of those on the bottom. And then remember that trig identity, secant squared minus tan squared is one. So I can replace that with one. Okay. And you guys, I really tried hard not to go too crazy on the trig identities. You know, as long as you know a few, like the Pythagorean ones, you're good. Let me see, dude. Did I put them on the sheet? Guess not. I think I hand wrote them on one of mine. But um, all right. So there's a question. How did I get the secant tan, secant tan, like these two on the top? Okay. So I distributed. I distributed this times tan x. So that's how I got the first, you know, secant times tan squared. And there's the minus there. And then I distributed everything in the box times the minus one. So that gives me a plus. And then one times the box is just the box. Does that make sense? Okay. I love that. Ah, right? It's the aha. <laughs> That's what might hook us, isn't it? In STEM. There's something so satisfying about when you get it. And, you know, it's hard to explain, right? <laughs> Or am I the only crazy one here? <laughs> no, free. it is a good, it's a great feeling. Right. I'm like, feel free to like join in with me. because, <laughs> You know, in person, I can see everybody nodding and stuff. But online, it's just like, <laughs> and sometimes I am the only crazy one. And I'm used to that. And I'm good. But okay, I appreciate the, the feedback. <laughs> It's so true, isn't it? It's hard oh, to... Oh, very. It's lovely when it just... Oh! Like, oh, yeah. yes, I get it. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I wonder if they've ever done a study, like, endorphins must be released, and there's yes. just some pleasurable, like, thing. You For know? sure. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That was our kumbaya moment, right? <laughs> <laughs> All right.
And see, sometimes like we STEM people are said to be like, you know, you know, like as as opposed to like the artsy people, right? Are said to be like stereotypical, stereotypically more emotional, and we're supposed to be like more cold and all of that. Like I disagree. I yeah, disagree. I I think there's a lot of overlap rather than you know. For sure. In fact, uh Almost every single mathematician or like physicist that I've ever spoken to has some kind of artistic streak. Like most of them, they'll play an instrument. I play cello. Um, I also paint. Or, you know, they do something. They do something on the creative side as well. You know, they yes. write poetry. I actually do that too. <laughs> um, but yeah. There's, there's a lot of overlap. And I always remember, you know, my husband's a musician. When I was in grad school, he used to help me with my math. And he didn't know the language of math, but if I could give it to him in layman terms, you know, he would give me like some creative response that would help me to solve a problem because I'd be yeah. stuck, you know, and I'd need to come at something from a different direction. And he just thinks outside of the box and naturally. He's like a real musician as opposed oh. to me. In my in my brain, everything I, I process is images and colors. It's not necessarily words or numbers. I, and I, I put that into my notes. All, all these different things, they have colors or uh, different parts of a whole image in my brain. Right? Yeah. Yep. I kind of do that too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And well, yeah, I could go on and on. I, you know, I've thought about all of these things for a long time. So I've, you know, I've got philosophies on everything, and you know, not everything, but on a lot. Okay, for which values of f does the graph of f have a horizontal tangent line? And here's our F. Okay, so we know, you know, roughly what that graph looks like. It looks like some kind of a sine curve. It's going to have some, oops, it's going to have some curviness, isn't it? And so, you know, for which values of X does this graph have a horizontal tangent line? Well, that's going to be where the derivative is zero. Oops. Okay. So let's take the derivative. Derivative of x is 1. Derivative of sine is cosine. And now let's set that derivative to 1. Notice this is a separate line. This is one of my pet peeves where students will just, you know, write the equal zero on the first line. It's just a pet peeve. Unless you wrote set f prime equal to zero, you know. But anyways, subtract one from both sides and then divide both sides by two. So we're looking at where does the cosine equal negative a half? Where does cosine equal negative a half? And so you guys remember having the um, reference angle. You know, I always think of this as being like the negative one, and this as being the two, and this as being the root three in that angle that triangle. 
And so your reference angle there is pi over three. And so that gives you, um, let's look into another color. Okay, so that gives you a two pi over three angle. And then you could also put that same triangle down here, right? Where you still have the negative one over the two. And so this angle is four pi over three. So for the purple angle there, right, you've got two pi over three plus two pi n, because that's gonna happen with each multiple of two pi. And then for the black angle there, you've got four pi over three plus two pi n. And so you could write both of those together as pi plus or minus pi over three, which is really kind of another way to just look at that graph, right? You've got an angle of pi and then plus or minus the pi over three, and then plus two pi n. Is that good so far right there? I feel like I have to make a motion. It's so hard online sometimes. Right, but you have that flat line. So it's a pi angle all the way across and then either plus or minus the pi over three. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I'm like making all these, but um, yeah. And then plus two pi n because you could keep going around that circle two pi, right? And so now we can factor out a pi from this term and this term. And you've got two times n over here and then plus one, plus or minus pi over three. Okay, and now this also ought to make sense that you have, you know, odd multiples of pi because you want to land on that right side, right? There's one pi, add two more pi, you're at three pi, you're at five pi, et cetera. So those odd multiples of pi and then plus or minus the pi over three. Okay. All right, now we're going to go back up to where we started with those definitions. Wow. Right, these two definitions right here. No, it only slips on my camera. This little screen on my iPad is so small. I was hoping to kind of have that. 
when we need it, you know. It's gonna go away, but okay. Um, find the limit. The limit as x goes to zero of sine of five x over seven x. So notice here, you know, this definition, the limit as theta goes to zero. So if theta is the variable we're using, the independent variable, right? This has to be the independent variable, right? And this has to be, in other words, all three of these have to be the same, okay? Huh. Maybe I should just do what I I did in my notes here. And again, I would use curly um, theta. I've seen people do a straight bar through there, and it just, you know, wouldn't do it. <laughs> All right, so, oh, you know, I want to have the same thing in the argument of the sign as I have on the bottom. And so what I'm gonna do, right, I have a five X up here, down here I have a seven X. I'm gonna multiply the top and the bottom by five because I want the bottom to have a 5x. And now I'm going to bring, I'm going to bring this 7 and this 5 out in the front. But now I at least have the same argument as I have, you know, on the bottom. Okay, are you guys good to there? And my motivation for doing it, multiplying by a five, I want a five on the bottom. Okay, and now I'm going to use a change of variable and let theta be 5x. And notice as x goes to zero, theta also goes to zero. Right, if x goes to zero, theta also goes to zero. And so. I'm going to change that to the limit as theta goes to zero of sine theta over theta. And now using that definition, right, this whole limit equals one. One times five sevenths is five sevenths. Okay, so that's pretty handy. Another technique for finding a limit. Okay, so first of all, that thing is begging to be factored, isn't it? <laughs> and oh, I wonder if one of the factors is x minus 2. Well, 
well, sure. <laughs> right. And now remember, um, the limit of a product is the same as the product of the limits. So I'm going to split this up into a product of 1 over x plus 8 and then times this one with the sign where the top has, you know, the argument that's the same as the bottom. And now let theta be x minus 2. And so as x goes to 2, right, when x and 2 get close, theta goes to 0. So now I can replace the second one here. The limit as theta goes to zero of sine theta over theta. This is one. So you have one times that first limit. And as x goes to 2, you just get, you know, 1 over 2 plus 8. So you just get 1 tenth. Okay. So let's look at some of the homework. Yeah, I took that fingerprint thing off. It's driving me crazy. All right, with 3.3, .3, right? So there are only 13 problems. Um, we did one like this. Could use the product rule, right? The first times the derivative of the second plus the second times the derivative of the first. Same here, same here. That's the quotient rule. It has you do it step by step. Here they're asking you to show that the left hand side is the right hand side. So they prompt you to kind of do one step at a time. Right. Derivative of cosecant is 1 over sine. And then you can use the quotient rule, the bottom times the derivative of the top minus the top times the derivative of the bottom, et cetera, all over the bottom squared. Okay. Looks nicer here. <laughs> Find the equation of the tangent line. Find an equation of the tangent line. <sighs> this is to find the first derivative and then the second derivative. First and second derivative, you could use, um, what you call it, the quotient rule, <laughs> what you call it. 
For which values does the graph have a horizontal tangent line? Um, find the velocity and acceleration. So this is the equation of motion. The velocity is the first derivative. The acceleration is the second derivative. Right. And here are some of these. Find the limit using those definitions. Okay. So you ought to be good there. Let's go ahead and take a break and we'll be back at 11, okay? Welcome back. Okay, guys. So next up is the chain rule. Something to try to type some of this. <laughs> the chain rule says if G is differentiable at X and F is differentiable at G of X, then, well, that's not bad. <laughs> Then capital F, which is F composed with G, is differentiable at X. So in other words, that's another way of writing it. And F prime, and here we go with making sure you can distinguish between small F and big F, right? So basically the derivative of the composition, it's the derivative of that outer function times the derivative of the inner function. Okay. Um, in Leibniz notation, dy dx is dy du du dx. Where you have an outer function y of u and an inner function. So many. Okay, so I know it seems, I don't know, like there's a lot of notation. But again, you know, if ever you have a function inside another function, when you take the derivative, it's the derivative of the outer times the derivative times the derivative of the inner. Okay. And you can see here why we call it the chain rule, because this chain is kind of formed. You could imagine the du's canceling. All right, so right in the form f of g of x where y is f of u and u is g of x, and then find dy dx. 
So using Leibniz notation. Okay. So we have our function here, cube root of one plus four X. So the idea is to recognize that we have an outer function, the cube root function. Right. If I said, what kind of a function is that? It's a cube root function. And it's not just the cube root of a number that gives you a constant. The cube root of 27 is 3. It's the cube root of another function inside. Okay, so can you guys identify there's an outer function, a cube root function, and an inner function, 4x plus 1. That's a linear, linear function. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Good, good, good. Okay, so we won't, We really need to be able to, you know, kind of break these apart. So, um, why we're going to write it as a function of u is the cube root of u. And then u is a function of x. That's the inside stuff. Okay, and then dy du, this is the derivative of y with respect to u. So that's u to the one third, right? So the derivative of y with respect to u, you bring the one third down and then subtract one from the power. And then take the derivative of u with respect to x. And so now you can form this chain, right? dy dx is dy du du dx. So dy du, it's one third. And you can bring the u down in the bottom. I don't know why I did it this way, but okay. <laughs> and made it a positive two thirds. And so the root three is on the bottom and then times four. And then in the end, you wanna substitute back what u is, right? U is one plus four X. Okay, so this is the derivative of that function y. Okay, so again, we want to identify the outer function. It's a, a cubic, or not cubic, a quartic function. I had one job. It's a quartic, right? So we could write y as a function of u. It's u to the fourth. And then u is a function of x. That's the inner stuff. 
So dy du is 4u cubed. And du dx is 6x squared. So dy dx can be formed by making a chain and then substitute in each piece. And then substitute back in for you. And then I just multiply the, you know, six times four is 24 and write the X squared in the top, at the top. Okay. So here's another one. All right, so check it out, you guys. We know the derivative of tangent x is secant squared x but we don't know what the derivative of tangent of pi times x is. Okay, so all of those, you know, derivatives, literally, it's just the one argument. That's it. There can't be anything else inside those arguments. If there is, then you have to use the chain rule. So let y be a function of u, and that's a tangent function. And then let u be a function of x. So dy du, now we know how to take the derivative of tangent of just one variable. And again, make the chain. dy dx, it's dy du, du dx. So that is secant squared u times pi. And then we're gonna put the pi in the front and plug back in for you, it's pi x. Okay. Sometimes people will put, you know, parentheses around the, if there's more than one thing in the argu argument, sometimes people will put parentheses around. To me, I think it's obvious when it's a, a constant times the variable there. All right, how about sine of cotangent? <laughs> so y is going to be the outer function in terms of u, and u is going to be the inner function in terms of x. So the derivative of sine is cosine derivative of cotan is negative cosecant squared. So then make the chain. So you've got cos u times minus cosecant squared x. And then plug back in for u. And I'm just going to put the negative in the front. Okay. 
And so notice ultimately, you know, the derivative with respect to X needs to be completely in terms of X. So wherever you had a U, you had to substitute back in. Okay. All right, so the derivative of e to the u, it's going to be the derivative of the outer function times the derivative of the inner function. So for example, If you're taking the derivative of e to the 3x, again, we know that the derivative of e to the x is e to the x. There's just an x, and you're just taking the derivative with respect to x. But here, you take the derivative of the outer function, e to something, times the derivative of the inner function. Okay. Also, the derivative of b to the x it's b to the x natural log of b. Okay, you might recall from uh, 3.1. But if you had a function b to the x, that derivative was f prime of zero b to the x. So the f prime of zero turns out to be natural log of b. All right, now also, I'm just going to remind you of log properties and things because you're going to need to know this or it's going to be miserable. Uh, so first, remember that e to the x and natural log of x are inverses. So that means if you compose them, Either way, you get x. So if I stick natural log of x into the exponent of e, I get x. And if I stick the function e to the x into the natural log function, I get x. Okay, that's uh, one of the definitions for inverse functions that we learn in even algebra. You probably saw it again in pre-calculus. And then log properties. Okay, so log base b of a product, m times n, is the log of the first plus the log of the second. It's the product rule.
the log of the quotient. This is the quotient rule. It's the log of the top minus the log of the bottom. And then there's the power rule, the log of something raised to a power P. You can bring the power down in front and multiply the log. Okay, so that's the product rule, quotient rule, power rule. So back to this right here. Let's prove that. So let y be b to the x. I can write that as e to the natural log of b to the x. because these two undo each other and you're back where you started. Okay, now using the power rule, I can bring that X down. And now I can make use of the chain rule and write y as a function of u, the outer function is e to the u, and then the inner function is a function of x. So dy du is e to the u, du dx is natural log of b. It's a number, it's a constant. Derivative of x is just one. So y prime is dy dx, which is dy du, du dx. So plug in e to the u and then times natural log of v. And then you're gonna substitute back in the u And so again, that's just b to the x. Right. You can put the x back up in the exponent and e to the natural log cancels each other out and you just have b to the x. Okay, so that's why the derivative of b to the x is b to the x natural log b. So just as an example, the derivative of five to the X, it's five to the X natural log five. Okay. How about the derivative of five to the two X? Okay, again, this only works when you're taking the derivative with respect to that one variable, and that's the only thing up in the exponent. If there's anything else, now that is five raised to a function. Okay, so we have to use the chain rule. So let y be, you know, a function of u, 
and then u is a function of x. So dy du, it's 5u natural log 5, and du dx is 2. So dy dx dy du du dx and then just substitute in and then in the end you have to substitute back in for u and I'm going to just put the 2 in the front and the natural log 5 these are constants in the front and then times 5 to the 2x okay So again, we're using this Leibniz notation, and then pretty soon we're not going to anymore. <laughs> Find the derivative using Leibniz notation. Okay, so again, we have a quartic, so let y be a function of u, and u is the function inside. dy du and du dx. And then dy dx is the chain, dy du du dx. And then you can substitute back in for the U. Cubed, cubed. Okay. We can simplify this one some more. So with this first um, factor here, I'm going to factor out an x cubed. So I have five X cubed plus two. And then with the next one, I can factor out a six X squared. So I get five X cubed plus one. Okay, so I'm going to pull out the
x to the ninth and the six x squared here. Right, so six times four gives me 24. And then I have x to the ninth times x squared is x to the 11th. Okay. All right, find the derivative. Square root of 5x plus 1. Just trying to see if, okay. Are we still using log to find the derivative or will you tell us when to do that? What do you mean using a log? We're using LN, right? Like the past problems, yeah, like L using LN. Like, are we using LN to find the derivative right there? The only reason why we're using natural log is if you're taking the derivative of a constant to the x. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah, that's the only reason why. Okay. And so only with, you know, those. <laughs> um, when it has like a power, right? Like b to the power? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so. On you this know, I can... Oh, I'm sorry. You were saying? No, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, the problem that we were, or that you just wrote down, are we still going to use LN? No, right? No, see, this is not B to the X, right? Okay. This is a it's power you. function oh, okay. instead of an exponential function. So yeah, there's a difference between, and I'm glad you're bringing this up, you know, just kind of like as a reminder even. Right, this is a power function where you have, you know, the base is x raised to some number. Yeah. Like x to the fifth or something. As opposed to, you know, the base raised to a power. Okay. So that would be like 5x. So see the difference. Okay. And then you would use ln for the bottom. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Okay. Yeah. So yeah, the derivative of the top one is 5x to the fourth. And the derivative of the bottom one is 5x natural log. It would be 5x ln 5? Yeah. For the derivative? Okay, got you. And that was the one we did here. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Cool. So Thank like, you for that clarification. Yeah. So as opposed to, like, if you took the derivative of um, x to the fifth, and that'd be 5x to the fourth. So these two. And I was going to say, I mean, I kind of just take it for granted that, 
you know, we've learned all these rules, but I know for you guys, they're all still very new. Uh, so, I mean, I'm just saying, I recognize it's a lot. It's a lot, I know. Uh, all right. So here, the outer function is the square root function. So we can write this to the one half. So the outer function, it's the square root function, something to the one half. And then the inner function is the stuff inside. And then take the derivatives. I had one job. <laughs> right, you bring the half down, you get negative a half. Oh, hold on just a second. Okay. Okay. We're back. We're back. Okay. So then make that chain dy dx is dy du du dx. It's on a different screen. <laughs> Sorry. And thank you so much for telling me because, yeah. <laughs> How long might I have gone on? Okay, so I made the chain. <laughs> Peace. <laughs> it's all right. It was just like five seconds. Yeah. Okay, so that's five over two times the square root of u which is 5x plus 1. Right. I am recording, right? Yeah, okay. Okay, so again, with the trig functions, we only know how to take the derivative of just the one variable that you're taking the derivative with respect to. So otherwise you have to use the chain rule. So let y be the outer function, and then u is that inner function. So dy du, it's the opposite of sine u. And then du d theta is 2 theta. So f prime of theta, it's dy d theta. Which is dy du du d theta negative sine u times 2 theta. And u is theta squared. And we'd normally just put the, you know, 2 theta in the front. It's fine the other way, but it just, it looks a little messy. Oh, 
Okay, so again, all of these, the idea is you take the derivative out of the outer function and then times the derivative of the inner function. Okay, so we could think of this as cos theta squared. And then let y be the outer function. And then u is the inner function. So dy du is 2u and du d theta is negative sine theta. So g prime theta is dy d theta, which is dy du du d theta. So put the negative out in front and I'm going to substitute back in for you. It's cos theta. Okay. Can anybody think of another way to find that derivative? What would be another way to find that derivative? Uh, maybe an identity. Like... It's not a bad idea, although it'd probably make it more complicated. <laughs> but we could think of rule? yeah, we could think of post squared. Of, co of cosine times cosine. So I'll put or. And then we could use the product rule. So it's the first times the derivative of the second plus the second times the derivative of the first. Then you can factor out a cosine. I meant to change to green. Alas. So that's cos theta minus two sine theta. So same thing. And really either way is fine. It depends on which way you see it first probably. All right. So again, I want to just say, even though we've been using Leibniz notation, um, you know, we could think in terms of take the derivative of the outer function and then times the derivative of the inner function. Hoping there might be kind of some nice, easy one. <laughs> but of course, there's not. All right. Um, so suppose you have this one. 
because the Leibniz notation forming those chains just gets a little cumbersome. That's why. Okay, so this is a product, right? You see how we have one function is x squared and it's multiplying another function e to the negative three x. So for the derivative, we're gonna use the product rule and it's the first. And I'm gonna write the derivative of the second like that. Just so we don't get too bogged down, you know, we can kind of focus on one step at a time. So right now, let's just focus on the product rule. It's the first times the derivative of the second plus the second times the derivative of the first. Does that make sense? Just writing the product rule. And then on your next step, you can take those derivatives. So again, when you take the derivative of e to the negative 3x, it's the derivative of the outer function. You could picture that being just e to the u, and now times the derivative of the inner function, which is just negative 3. And then the derivative of x squared is 2x. And so we're going to factor stuff out. We're going to factor out an x and factor out an e to the negative 3x. And then I'm going to start over here because this one's positive. So you just have a 2 left and then minus 3x. Okay. So we can see why the Leibniz notation would just be way too cumbersome, you know? Okay, so again, here we have a product. So taking the derivative, we're gonna use the product rule and it's the first times the derivative of the second plus the second times the derivative of the first. and then go ahead and take those derivatives. So with sine, the derivative of sine, that's the outer function, is cosine, and then times the derivative of what's inside. So is that okay for that? And again, the derivative of the outer function is just e to the at. And the derivative of the inner function, a times t, it's just the constant a, because this is a function of t. And that makes me want to eat. <laughs> so we'll factor out the e to the at, and then it's customary to write those coefficients in front of the trig functions.
Okay, and so in your physics classes, you're going to see these kinds of functions show up. But is this good? You guys are good with the chain rule? I'll get there. <laughs> That's the old college spirit. All right. Um, okay, so we can think of this as all the stuff inside to the one half. And then we can use the chain rule. Take the derivative of the outer function. Right? And then times the derivative of the inner function. The inner function is a quotient. So you have to use the quotient rule. So it's the bottom times the derivative of the top, which is one, minus the top times the derivative of the bottom, which is one, all over the bottom squared. Now, do you guys remember If you have a fraction to a negative power, you can flip it upside down and, and make it positive. Okay, so here I can flip this fraction upside down and make that positive. And then in the brackets, you know, multiplying by one doesn't do anything. So I have X plus one minus X. So the X's cancel and I just have one over X plus one squared. And then do you remember um, if you have the square root of a fraction, it's the square root of the top over the square root of the bottom, as long as um, A and B are both positive. So in other words, oops. I've got x plus one to the half up here. And I, I could write that as the square root of x on the bottom. And then remember the quotient rule, right? When you have the same base, you can subtract the exponents. So you get one half minus two is negative three halves. You know what I do though, is I kind of subtract on the bottom. So like, um, if you have, what letters did they used to use? I think they use A, same base. Right, so I do the two minus a half on the bottom. And so that gives you X plus one to the three halves. Okay.
Okay, so again, you could use the Leibniz notation or you could just do the derivative of the outer function times the derivative of the inner function. Let's do the Leibniz notation first. So first you have r as a function of u. And then you have u as a function of t. And then take the derivatives. So the derivative of 10 to the u is 10 to the u natural log 10. Derivative of um, two root t Right, derivative of the square root of t, it's one over two root t. So the twos will cancel and you just have one over root t. So basically, uh, the twos cancel. All right, so r prime of t, that's dr du du dt. And then just plug in back for you. Okay, and you know, I just want to say again, you know, without the Leibniz notation, the derivative of the outer function Right, that's a base to a power function. So the derivative of a base to a, a power, it's the base to the power times the natural log of the base. That's the derivative of the outer function. And then times times the derivative of the inner function. The inner function is the two root t. Oops, one job. Okay, so the Leibniz notation, it's kind of like training wheels, you know? So we can see, you know, we're doing the derivative of the outer function, just the 10 to the whatever, it's the 10 to the whatever times the natural log of the base. The 10 to the whatever times the natural log of the base. And see here, we use u as a dummy variable, but in the end, we have to substitute that back in anyway, right? This is the 10 to the whatever times natural log of the base, and then times the derivative of what's inside. Do you guys see what I'm saying? Yeah. Okay. 
There's one, yeah, anyway. <laughs> I don't know about the other 17 of you. Oh, I I got it. I... Okay. <laughs> That's two. <laughs> All right. If you haven't gotten it yet, we'll be continuing to do this. All right. How about um, the derivative of y equals e to the tan theta? So for the derivative, it's the derivative of the outer function. That's e to the whatever, e to the u. And now you have to take the derivative of what's in the side. You see? And then the derivative of tangent is secant squared. So again, you could have used Leibniz. Right, so you let y be a function of u for the outer function, and u is a function of theta. That's the inner function the derivative of the outer function and the derivative of the inner function. And then you form the chain which is the derivative of the outer function times the derivative of the inner function. And you have to plug back in for you. Right? And we would normally write the secant squared first, although it doesn't matter. Okay. So all that Leibniz notation just helps us to keep it all straight. Okay, cool. I know it don't feel bad if it's not clicking yet you know yeah I'm gonna need time and patience it's a lot of information to process but breaking it, it down it, over the week it'll be much easier okay good All right so this is the derivative of the outer function which is right here, derivative of the outer function. And you have to substitute back in the tangent eventually, you know, for you. And then times, I'm trying to do two different colors, right? Times the derivative of the inner function. What's the inner function? This is the derivative of the square. inner function. Mm -hmm. So literally this chain, it's saying, you know, take the derivative of the outer function times the derivative of the inner function. That's exactly what the chain is saying to do. So you take the derivative of the outer function times the derivative of the inner function. I know I've just made a mess there now. Just trying to say it many different ways.
All right, so that's e to the z over z minus one. So for the derivative, you take the derivative of the outer function. e to the u is just e to the u. And now times the derivative of the inner function. This is the u. The stuff up in the top is the u. So that's what you're taking the derivative of for the inner function. That's a quotient. So it's the bottom times the derivative of the top, which is one, minus the top times the derivative of the bottom, which is one, all over the bottom squared. Okay, so those z's cancel and you're left with a negative one. Which I'll put in the front. And all of that on the bottom. Okay. And what section wouldn't be complete without? Find the equation of the tangent line. To the curve, let's just say, okay. At the point. So I have two problems. And the first one, it's this curve. At this point. Okay, so the slope of the tangent line is the derivative at that point. So we need to take the derivative. It's a quotient, so we need to use the quotient rule. It's the bottom times the derivative of the top. Derivative of two is zero. So this whole thing is going away. Minus the top times the derivative of the bottom. I'm just going to write it like that. All over the bottom squared. Okay, so let's take that derivative. The derivative of 1 is 0. The derivative of e to the u is e to the u, right? That's the derivative of the outer function. The derivative of the inner function, the negative x is just negative one. Okay, so nothing happens there. And then you get negative two times negative one. That's positive two e to the negative x over all that squared. And again, the slope, it's that derivative at that point where x is zero.
So you're going to put zero in. Okay, e to the zero is one. So you just have two times one. And on the bottom, you have one plus one squared. So you get a slope of a half. And then that point was zero one. So you've got y minus one. It's the slope times x minus zero. Okay. So that's the equation of the tangent line. You guys want to try this one? Find the equation of the tangent line to that curve at that point. So the derivative of b to the x is b to the x times natural log of b, which is 2. And then the slope, it's the derivative at 0. Two to the 0 is 1. So you've got y minus 1, it's that slope, times x minus 0. Leave that as an exact answer unless the problem asks you to, you know, approximate, okay? Natural log of 2 times x. plus one, that's the exact answer, okay? All right, so let's look at some of your homework. This was 3.4. Okay, so for the given composite function, identify the inner function, u, and the outer function, y. So notice they list them the other way around than I do. I do the outer one first and then the inner one. I mean, they've just listed them in the opposite order. So I'm just pointing that out. Um. Okay, but then here, they have it the same way. So they want you to list the outer function first with the u and a comma, and then the inner function, right, as a function of x, and then find the derivative. Okay. So I just want to make sure you guys are good with how to enter, you know, So tan of pi x 
The outer function is tan u. The inner function is pi x. e to the 7 root x. The outer function is e to the u. And the inner function is 7 root x. Okay. Et cetera, et cetera. So we've done some, like, all of these. That's a product rule. Product rule. Quotient rule. Chain rule. We did one just like that. Yep, we did one like that. We did one like that. Oh, this is also asking for a second derivative. But no big deal. Um, we did a find the equation of the tangent line. Um, find the velocity given that position function. So the velocity is the derivative, right? And then we know how to take the derivative. Same here, rate of change, you're just taking the derivative. And then plug in t equals one into your you know, derivative function. And approximate, make sure you're in radian mode on your calculator. And that's it. Okay. Stop this.